webinars are made possible thanks to generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website, autism.org. get started, I'll introduce our speaker. Vicki Kobliner is a registered dietitian and nutritionist and owner of Whole Care Nutrition. She has lectured nationally and internationally about the role of nutrition in chronic disease. She utilizes a functional nutrition approach to maximize health, reduce disease risk, and help her clients heal from chronic illness. Vicki is also devoted to giving future moms a roadmap to help beat the one in four odds of having a child with chronic disease. And now I will turn this over to Vicki. Thank you, Denise. I'm so excited to be here. And as you mentioned, I have a real passion for, and a, you know, a real devotion to helping moms and dads avoid or reduce their risk of having a child with a chronic illness. We can love our children to, to the moon and back and devote so much energy and effort and emotion and money and all those things to helping our sick kids. But at the end of the day, we all wish, you know, for a healthy, happy, thriving baby and a healthy, happy, thriving child. And that is what this conversation is going to be about today. It's preconception planning for risk reduction. So I just want to reiterate something that you um, already mentioned, which was that all information, all material in this webinar is for information purposes only. It is not a substitute for any kind of medical advice. Anything provided through this webinar is not um, individualized nor specific to treating, diagnosing or treating a health problem. So we just want to be clear on that. And so what is a healthy baby roadmap? It is basically a risk reduction strategy to help beat those one in four odds of having a child with chronic illnesses. And our kids are suffering from many, many chronic illnesses. Um, it, for me, it's a guide to navigating, what I've developed is a guide to navigating the clinical, nutritional, environmental and lifestyle changes you can make, you can own, you can impact, be empowered to optimize your child's life and enhance your family's experience by reducing risk of chronic disease. It's a resource for parents who are looking for evidence-based advice and are tired of checking out Dr. Google and aren't really sure what to believe. And it's a program to help you feel more empowered and more confident. So some of the things that can happen today or will should happen today is you should Learn about areas of concern, the things that you can do differently or the things you should know about before you get pregnant. Um, and again, I just want to kind of qualify here. If you're already pregnant or if you're planning to get pregnant very soon and you can't do all of this, that doesn't mean all is lost. There are many things you can do prenatally. There are many things you can do postnatally. But, um, and we can always, you know, adapt many of these things to that. But right now, the focus of this lecture specifically is on preconception and what you can do there but you'll learn about areas of concern. You'll see the data, you'll see some, some research studies that point to what we know about these areas. You'll get a big picture kind of top line view, you know, of what is actually, what can be changed and what is affecting future and current risk. And then walk away with easy strategies to mitigate some of that risk. You're not gonna get individualized health information. You don't need to be a scientist. You don't have to understand all the jargon. You just want to know the basics. You're not going to get all the answers. This is actually the tip of the iceberg, but I'm hoping that you don't feel alone and that you don't feel like you're left with a lot of information, but no resources. So what the statistics are clear. Um, over one in three kids in this country have a chronic illness. 26 of them have what's called a functional deficit or a functional difficulty. Um, difficulty breathing or other respiratory problems that can include things like asthma, eating or swallowing, digestion, including constipation, diarrhea, dysbiosis, um, repeated or chronic pain, headaches, back and body pain, problems with coordination, and difficulty concentrating, remembering, or making decisions. That's a one quarter of children in this country are suffering from that. And these statistics can be scary. 20% of kids have a food allergy. Um, and one of the things that I want to be clear is these numbers will not add up to 100 because some people have, some kids have more than one of these issues, but they, co they exist in this country in these, at these levels. And these levels are increasing in every single one of these cases 
we are seeing increasing levels of these chronic illnesses. 20% have a food out or other allergy, of which a third of those, set approximately 7% are food allergies. 7.5% have asthma, 12% eczema, 20%, we're talking one in five kids in this country has obesity. And obesity is not, this is not a fat shaming conversation, but obesity leads to number of points to certain things and leads to certain things. Obesity is a chronic inflammatory condition. When kids are chronically inflamed, it leads to other things down the road. Um, in addition, obesity can result from chronic inflammation and poor gut health, and poor gut health is an indicator of other things as well. So the obesity information is important, not because of weight per se, but because of what tells us about other things that are happening. 3% um, of children in this country have an autism spectrum disorder, 1.5% are moderate to severe. We have almost 10% with ADHD. One, almost one in four, greater than one in five kids with some sort of mental, emotional, or developmental problem, and 20% with special health care needs. So we've got a lot of sick children. Um, and those statistics are meant to scare you. I don't, I want them to scare you a little bit, but then I also want you to understand that number one, knowledge is power. The more we know about this, the more we can do about it. Knowing this allows you to take action to modify those outcomes. You can do things that can reduce the risk for your specific child. Now, of course, there are no guaranteed outcomes, but making change now can have a positive effect. You can learn your unique risk factors. So you know what matters to you in this case. You may have more factors that may influence asthma. Somebody else may have more factors that influence diabetes, for example, or eczema. You can make changes before conception and throughout your pregnancy and advocate for yourself and your child. So what are some of the things we know and that have been proven over and over? We know that nutrition, prenatal, preconception and prenatal nutrition can profoundly affect development and overall health of the neonate and of the child. And overall inverse association between folic acid or vitamin supplementation and a child's risk of autism spectrum disorder. So in this study, the lower the folic acid or the lower the, multi, the nutrients, um, the higher the risk of autism, the more children were supplemented appropriately. It's not the more the better, but more appropriate supplementation, the lower the risk of autism. So something simple like a multivitamin or the appropriate type of folate. As, and again, that was folic acid. We're gonna talk a little more about folate in this, co in this conversation today, um, but making sure that moms have adequate amounts of that can affect their, their risk. So that's an amazing thing to know. Um, we also know the microbiome. Microbiome relates to the balance of good and bad bacteria in our gut. This study from 2019, it was an evaluation, talks about if you look down at the bottom here, maternal metabolic status and diet during pregnancy have a key impact on the maternal and infant microbiota. Now, what we also know, the second step of that is the maternal and the infant microbiota have profound impacts on acute and long-term health. So diet during pregnancy impacts your microbiome, the microbiome impacts your child's health long-term. So here we go, planting the seed. This is a review article from a number a few years ago. The establishment of the fetal microbiome begins with the birthing process. That was what it was assumed. However, we know that's not true anymore. We know that it happens. The placenta has a microbiome. The baby is exposed to that, that good bacteria and a balance of get bacteria from conception. And then again, look at the bottom sentence here. Mother to child efflux of bacteria, that means the transition, the, the sharing, during pregnancy has the potential to markedly influence postnatal health. Mom's microbiome at conception and throughout pregnancy can impact a child's long-term health. This is huge, huge stuff for us to think about. So, but it's not just the microbiome and it's not just your vitamin and mineral status. What also matters is what kind of toxins we're exposed to. And this is a pretty old study, but it was profound and it's one that I use in almost every lecture I give. It was done by the Environmental Working Group, which is an organization I support unconditionally. They are just so wonderful. They, they are devoted. It's a nonprofit organization devoted to helping um, the population understand the risks and um, of environmental exposures to toxins. They did a study where they actually took very few, it was only 10 families, 10 mothers, but they took the cord blood of the babies and they took the cord blood immediately after birth and examined it and they evaluated it for chemicals. So 287 chemicals detected in the cord blood of newborn babies 
we think the placenta is something that protects babies, but it doesn't. These chemicals can get across the placenta into the child and into their cord blood. Of those, 180 cause cancer, 217 are toxic to the brain, 208 can cause birth defects. So we really need to try to detoxify our children early and understand that the more we support our own detoxification, and by that I don't mean fancy detox cleanse things, I mean looking at how we feed ourselves and what we put in our bodies and what we expose ourselves to, we can reduce the, the burden of our children by reducing what's going in the bucket. So here is another um, abstract of an article that was published that basically says at the bottom, our findings suggest that for many chemicals, fetuses may experience higher exposures than their mothers. Now, what that means is on a body burden basis, you know, we as moms weigh probably, you know, I don't know how, you know, we weigh an average somewhere 100, 150, 200 pounds, but as mothers, when you have a fetus that's getting an exposure to a chemical and they weigh a pound, that body burden is much greater. And we need to figure out how to reduce that body burden for children because those sources of exposure do affect them later in life. So I really, and it's, this is the point where I like to stop and say, I hope I haven't scared you. I hope you are not feeling panicked right now. This is about facts. It's not about fault and it's not about fear. This, is, this, this epidemic of chronic illness is not the fault of any woman or women in general. We are not responsible for this. We do have some level of empowerment around it, but this is not our fault. It is a combination of lack of environmental regulation. So we are exposed to more and more chemicals over time that we really don't know the synergistic effects of and we really haven't studied in, in neonates. It's a disconnect between business interests, companies who wanna you know, come up with a product and sell it, and we haven't really investigated how it impacts us biochemically, as well as um, that disconnect between that and individual and public health interests. We also have a medical model that doesn't really seek to look at root causes. So you'll wait till your child gets diagnosed with a disease, and then we want somebody to help us resolve it, fix it, address it, et cetera. But we're not looking at why, what were the clues that told us that maybe this disorder, this disease could have been modulated or avoided if we did things differently earlier on. And that is the entire medical model um, that we work with. So we wanna kind of turn that on its head if we can. Um, we're also looking at increasingly nutrient depleted and highly processed food supply, which leads to, again, not having enough of those vitamins and minerals that support postnatal health and childhood health. And also processed food, which increases inflammation, which you'll see is linked to um, more chronic illness. And a lack of adequate information. Every mother should know these things. It should be common knowledge and they should be helped to um, move to understand it. So, sorry, I just, so you guys need the facts so that you are empowered to make those choices. So what do we do when we're doing kind of a healthy baby roadmap, which is what I call it, what are we looking at? We're looking at your health history, yours and dad's, your grandparents, you know, the baby's, future baby's grandparents. What are your unique and personal risk factors? And those risk factors can be genetic. They can be in your family history. They can be your, you know, you as mom and dad, your medical history. For example, women with Hashimoto's, women with autoimmune diseases, are, are, it is known that they have a higher incidence or propensity to have a child with autism. That relates to chronic underlying inflammation. What can we do about that? There are things we can do. Doesn't mean we can guarantee an outcome, but we can ameliorate the risk factor. Um, also looking at things like medications and supplements that people, that moms and dads are taking. We also need to look at nutrition. Clearly as a dietitian, that's a, you know truly important to me. What is the current diet? What is the water quality? What are people getting too much of and what do you need more of? So we might need more of certain nutrients, but you might be getting too much of inflammatory foods or inflammatory compounds or toxins from your food. And then there's certain nutrition, certain um, nutrients that are particularly important prenatally and around periconception that often aren't highlighted and parents aren't aware of before they get pregnant. And then we wanna look at lifestyle, both toxins in the environment, as well as physical activity and stress. And then we wanna take action. So if you know your health history, what risk factors are modifiable? Some will be, some won't be. <clears throat> I wanna look at testing. What testing might benefit us so we know more, we learn more and we can address more. How can you change those risk factors and which are the greatest priorities for you? You know, this, we, we can't address everything, 
but we want to figure out which are the greatest priorities. And then we want to think about the nutrition, take simple steps to change, change our diets, pick our priorities again, enhance the nutrient density of the diet, reduce the inflammatory triggers, and optimize those priority prenatal and preconception nutrients, such as, and these are things like vitamin D, choline, et cetera, which I'll talk more about soon. And then in terms of lifestyle, how do we do detoxify the environment? Our air, our water, our skin, our food, all can be vectors for bringing toxins into our bodies. How do we make sure we limit those and use the least toxic products we can? Stress management profoundly related to maternal, neonatal, and childhood health. And we live in a very stressed society. So we wanna address that as well. And then physical activity, because it's been shown in study after study, both to ameliorate stress, but also um, helps with mental and physical health, helps you prepare your body for pregnancy and for delivery, um, but also controls blood sugar management and uterine support, which we need when we're pregnant. And then I also like to talk a little bit about advocacy because sometimes a lot of this information is really new for somebody and they feel uncomfortable. Who do they talk to? Is the family gonna support them um, in changing diet or making environmental switches? Or what about your healthcare team? Do you feel comfortable talking about these things with your healthcare team? How do you assemble that? What if you want testing that's not routine? How do you ask for that? And how do you talk to a healthcare provider, um, showing them facts, but not challenging them in a way that's gonna make them not listen? Um, so, and how do you access those resources and find support? So all of that's important. So we'll circle back now and talk a bit about health history. Unique, what we wanna know is what are your unique and personal risk factors? And again, I just wanna remind you all that this is not a deep dive. This is a real kind of top line assessment of what's happening because I could spend hours talking to each one of you individually about what your personal risk factors are. But there are genetic, genetic risk factors. One of them we're gonna talk about is something called MTHFR or methylfolate reductase gene. Um, many of you may have heard of it. I hope at this point, I wish, I, I hope everybody has, but some of you may not have heard of it. It's something you wanna know. There are other genes as well that are important for um, to you know pre periconceptually and preconceptually. We also want to know family history. Is there a history of asthma, allergies, autism, diabetes? All of those matter. Again, we talked a little bit about Hashimoto's and other autoimmune diseases. Knowing that's in your unique and personal history is going to help modify or affect the plan you put in place to, to mitigate your risks. And then things like medications and supplements. So when these are just a few of the things I look at when we talk about looking for clues. So for, if a client comes to me and says they've been having fertility challenges, it took them a long time to get pregnant or they're still struggling to get pregnant or they've, they've had multiple miscarriages. Well, some of the things that are linked to that are folate, processing folate is a, is a B vitamin that's very important for building new cells and also for detox. CoQ10 is another nutrient that's very important for um, supporting egg quality. So, and, but it also has to do with things like mitochondrial function. So if you are somebody who has fertility challenges or prior miscarriages, maybe low in folate, low in CoQ10, they may be having an immune dysregulation or gut health imbalances, all of which can affect fertility and maintenance of pregnancy. And those are things you want to know before you get pregnant because those can affect the health of the, the, health of the baby and their health as a child and you know, into adulthood. So again, I mentioned Hashimoto's, um, but other autoimmune disorders, again, if you've got an autoimmune disease, you may want to get off gluten. Gluten can be inflammatory in those conditions, and that increased inflammation can affect fetal development. Um, we also often see nutrient depletion with these autoimmune disorders, and we want to address those. And again, the immune dysregulation, the inflammation, critical factors here, and things that we want to address prior to conception. Now, again, if somebody here is already pregnant, you can also do this work during pregnancy. There are things you can do, um, and you can do it post-birth as well. Um, for you, and we can also evaluate baby. Then we have the family history, autism, ADD, anxiety, depression. Again, I circle back when I see those in a family, I'm really looking for folate metabolism, I'm looking for mitochondrial support, I'm looking for vitamin D status, I'm looking for gut health, immune dysregulation, so many different things. But these are pointers. They are arrows pointing us to look in certain areas. And then if you've had a prior birth history of a C-section or gestational diabetes, those will all impact um, fetal development, and we want to modulate them early. You know, we might want to change your diet really early if you've had a history of gestational diabetes and test carefully and early to make sure that we're balancing blood sugar because imbalanced blood sugars lead to inflammation. 
in terms of meds and supplements. One of our goals periconceptually and preconceptually is, are you getting enough of key nutrients? The ones that are so important for prenatal development, vitamin D, probiotics, choline, I mentioned omega-3s, there's many more. Um, and how do you choose a good prenatal? They're not all the same. I can spend half an hour, an hour talking about how to choose a good prenatal. Um, I never use a prenatal that has folic acid. I only use prenatals that have an active form of folate, one key piece. I only like prenatals that have some folate. Um, and I look at the source of B vitamins and I make sure that they are from um, effective and utilizable. They're, you know, you can take B12, for example, and you can complex it with different things. There's hydroxy, it's called cobalamin, hydroxycobalamin, methylcobalamin, adenosyl cobalamin, many different forms. Some are better than others. I like to use prenatal supplements that use the optimal forms. Also, where does that supplement come from? Is it from a company that sources its products in China where they may be, um, that they may be um, contaminated with mercury, other heavy metals, et cetera? Um, also, sorry, gotta go back there. Where is it tested? So where is it coming from? How is it tested? Is it tested in a third party lab or internally? If it's internal, I trust less that this is an objective test. What form is it? I talked about the forms of B12. Um, and how often is it tested is another piece. And then there are important medication and nutrient interactions. Things, and these are just a handful. Oral contraceptives deplete B vitamin status. B vitamins are essential for normal fetal development. So if a woman is coming off oral contraceptives, I would not plan on getting pregnant for at least three to six months because you really need to replete your B vitamins. Um, PPIs, if you have reflux and you're taking PPIs, they're also going to deplete, to deplete your B vitamins and antibiotics are going to do quite a number on your gut health. So for example, just to bring up the PPIs, like I said, we are going through a big top line on this, so I won't go into each thing in detail, but there's a study that looks at the possible association of acid suppressing drugs during PPIs or proton pump inhibitors. They're used for reflux acid suppressing drugs during pregnancy and childhood asthma. Data provides first evidence of significant association between in utero exposure to these drugs and the risk of developing childhood asthma. So why don't we try to figure out why a mom has reflux? Is it that her gut health isn't great? Is it that she needs a, you know, to use different nutrients or different herbs to help support better digestion? How can we enhance mom's digestion so she can get off the PPIs before she gets pregnant? So, and that leads us into gut health. During pregnancy, our gastrointestinal microbes, that, that balance of good and bad bacteria in the gut, undergoes profound changes. Um, those changes in early pregnancy can sometimes increase the risk of gestational diabetes and hypertension. And that sounds odd, but there's reasons that that happens. So we have to be especially careful to look at how moms are balancing blood sugar, but we also know that a balanced maternal gut is related to autoimmune disease and other lifelong diseases. So when the maternal gut is imbalanced, we see increases in that. When the maternal gut is balanced, we see protection. We also see the gut health directly impacting the risk of preterm labor and preterm labor itself can lead to all sorts of other issues. So we want to avoid preterm births and normalizing the microbiota can help with that. Um, and again, circling back to what I said before, your choice of diet, and how you have used antibiotics or how you've been prescribed antibiotics can affect gut health. So if you know that you've had a lot of antibiotics for infections in the past, we want to work on gut health really early on and hopefully before you get pregnant. So let's talk again about um, that methylfolate gene because it's a big one. The, MTA, the MTHFR gene, it's called methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. You don't have to say that 10 times fast but it provides instructions for your body to make a special protein which helps your body process folate. Your body needs active folate to make DNA, which you need to make babies, um, and, to, and modify other proteins. It also needs it for your own detoxification. It also needs it for normal neurotransmitter function and many other active um, events and, and biochemical processes. Now, folic acid is synthetic. It is not made by the body, it is never made by the body. Your body can use it to some level, but at a certain point we start to produce some, we see something in the bloodstream called UMFA, unmetabolized folic acid. 
And that kind of sends some false signals to the body that we have enough, when in essence, it may not be enough because it may not be this active form. So any mom, any family, any dad who has a methylfolate mutation may pass that on to baby. It doesn't mean you have a disease. It does not mean that. But it means you're probably not as effective at detoxing, not as effective as making those neurotransmitters, not as efficient as making those new cells. And so what we want to do is we want to help you by using those active forms. And just to give you a little, I thought this was pretty cute. It's from the CDC. So basically, your MTHFR C677T variant is the one that's most closely involved in this foliar process. CC is what you want. So maybe you got grandma and grandpa. He was normal. She had a variation. She had CT. Okay. You get one from each parent. So he, this guy, uncle got a C from both parents. He's pretty cool. However, your mom got the T from grandma. She got the C from grandpa. She's got a mutation. She married dad. Dad's got a mutation too. So the odds are any combo of this four, you can get a TT, you can get a CT, and you can get a TT or a CC. Um, so you can get any of these. It doesn't show the CC here, but you really can get any of them. So the bottom line is if you end up with the CC, it's all great. If you end up with the CT, you are probably, you are less efficient with your methylfolate. If you end up with a TT, you're even less efficient. It doesn't mean there's no function. It doesn't mean you have a disease, but um, it does mean that you want to support fully processing. Okay. So that's the takeaway there. Sorry. My, my slides are jumping around a little bit. I apologize. In terms of testing. So this is where you would want to think about, let me go back to my obstetrician. Let me figure some of this out. Let me know my vitamin D status. And again, I, we only talked very briefly about a few things, but let me find out my vitamin D status profoundly involved in fetal development. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. You also wanna check something called hemoglobin A1C, which looks at long-term blood sugar management. Vitamin A is also important, as is magnesium and zinc. B12 and folate levels can be helpful. A thyroid panel is often helpful, um, as well as the methylfolate gene, as well as looking at gut health. Um, there's also, you know, we may also wanna look at inflammatory markers. There are many, many things we can do. This is a very brief list, but some of the ones that I think are quite important that often are not tested in, in um, mom's prior conception. So let's talk about nutrition. What matters is what is our current diet? What is the variety? What is the nutrient density? And what is the quality? Let's look at our water. Is our water healthy and, and you know, vibrant and clean and rich in minerals or is it full of toxins? And let's think about what you need to get more of. What are those nutrients that you're not getting enough of that are really supportive of prenatal and, and childhood? And, and when I say childhood, I mean childhood into adulthood. Um, but that early onset of chronic disease. And what are you getting too much of? What are the inflammatory triggers? And then that focus on those priority preconception nutrients. So in terms of diet quality, when I look at protein, I really do like to um, focus on the difference between conventional versus organic versus pasture-fed animals. Um, and there is a big difference. I can't get around that. Not, and, and people, the biggest question I get about this is what if you can't afford organic or pasture fed? And that is a very valid question. There are ways to access these things cheaper. I use a meat delivery service that is all pasture fed meat, but it's local farms. I don't just buy the cuts I want. I agree to take whatever cuts they'll send me. It's markedly cheaper. It's about a dollar more a pound than conventional. And yes, that is still expensive but way less than what I would pay in the grocery store for organic and, and, and pasture fed, um, definitely pasture fed. But in terms of conventional versus organic versus pasture fed, conventional is something I really would love for families to be able to avoid. It is animals who are stressed, they are factory farmed, they are terrible conditions, they are fed antibiotics and hormones regularly, and we, when we eat them, we do ingest that. They are um, getting toxic feed, so they have those toxins in them as well. And there's a number of studies that show um, increased nutritional benefit to pasture-fed animals. You can't do conventional, you can do organic. Organic is great. It's much cleaner, less of those toxins. However, the only thing about organic I don't love is that organic animals are generally fed organic corn and organic soy. Organic corn and soy themselves can have some underlying issues. And I've never seen a cow eat corn and soy you know, on a pasture. They eat grass. So truly grass-fed animals, the ones that are allowed to free roam, are the most nourishing. But again, pick your spot here. If you can't do pasture-fed, 
don't feel guilty about it. Make whatever change you can. Um, maybe eat less meat overall if you can't afford organic, just so you're reducing that body burden. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing. This is about finding the things that work for you and your family. In terms of produce, pesticides are an issue, a big issue. And again, I showed you some studies about that, but there is clear and present evidence that ex increased exposure to pesticides is correlated with an increase in neurodevelopmental disorders. We know that. Um, so the more we can do clean produce, and again, I get my produce from a place, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but um, Misfits Market or Imperfect Foods are two companies that actually provide organic produce at a discount because what they do is they don't use the pretty stuff that you can actually sell in the store. They use the ones that are either too small or too big or funny shaped. Um, maybe they have a tiny bruise on them, but as a result, you get them much cheaper. So those are great things to use if you're trying to save money and still access these. Um, people ask me a lot about frozen, fresh, and canned. Not a fan if we can avoid it of canned vegetables or fruits, um, but fresh and frozen, the truth is fresh can be great, but frozen is picked at the point of, uh, is frozen at the point of being picked. And then when it's frozen, it retains all its nutrients. So I find them interchangeable. If keeping frozen fruits and vegetables in your house makes it easier to access them and saves you money, go for it. In terms of fats, we have a big difference between our inflammatory and anti-inflammatory fats. So our hydrogenated fats, some of our saturated fats are, are more inflammatory and excess of omega-6s, which come from a lot of vegetable oils, is pro-inflammatory. Anti-inflammatory fats include our omega-3s, things we get from nuts and seeds, avocados, olives, you know, monounsaturated fats. For all of those are great. So you want to get fats in. You don't want to avoid fats, especially for baby's growth, but you want to use the right type. And then I do like my moms to be eating fermented foods because the lacto-fermented foods, not just a sauerkraut you get locally you know, in the grocery store, it has to say lacto-fermented or contains good bacteria. Those really enrich your microbiome and get, can be super supportive. So the Environmental Working Group, I mentioned them before they did that study. I rely on them for so much. I hope I support them wholeheartedly and use them as a resource constantly. They come out every year with their Dirty Dozen and Clean 15. I hope most of you are aware of this, but this is a list of the 2021 Dirty Dozen and Clean 15. So if you're going to choose <clears throat> what you can buy organic and what you can't, onions, kiwis, broccoli, asparagus, all these ones on the right, the Clean 15, relatively safe. Um, if you can't afford them organic, I wouldn't worry too much about it. If you're going to be eating kale, spinach, strawberries, peaches, apples, et cetera, I would err on the side of buying them organic. And if you can't, you know, even if you can get them from a farmer's market or someplace local that's clean um, or wash them thoroughly. So the next thing we want to think about is our water. Water is filled with all kinds of chemicals, chlorine, fluoride, various chemicals that go into the water supply when we pour things down our sinks, including medications. Um, there are pesticides in the water supply and water when we drink it from there's BPA, bisphenol A, in the water supply, but we also get it if we drink from plastic water bottles. The other thing is water can often be missing minerals. And so one of the things we can do to support healthy water status is use a good quality filter. Um, I'm gonna talk about that later, we'll talk about filters. Um, and then those priority preconception nutrients, these are the big guns. Fiber, fiber is super important for gut health, it's super, super important for managing blood sugar, both of which are intimately involved in regulating um, good healthy fetal development, getting lots of vegetables in, using those B vitamins, including that right form of folate, iron, zinc, magnesium, all priority preconception nutrients, as well as omega-3s, which are those fatty, essential fatty acids from fish, nuts, seeds, vitamin D, vitamin A, choline, glycine, polyphenols, and antioxidants. And we're not going to talk about all of these. I picked, I cherry picked a few. The polyphenols and antioxidants are these very anti-inflammatory compounds that come from food and you want to get them from food and they're mostly found in plant foods, vegetables, specifically brightly colored fruits, brightly colored vegetables. They, there are some in things like nuts, seeds, and legumes, but really your produce is where you get it. So let's talk a little bit about omega-3s. EPA and DHA, DHA are super important. Um, DHA especially for fetal brain development. Um, they support eyes, nervous system, brain. They help prevent preterm labor. They support normal birth weight. I don't want to say overweight. Um, that's not what we're aiming for, but normal birth weight. Um, and they're also helpful for postpartum mood and pregnancy mood. 
Now, what you want to do is you want to get your omega-3s from safe fish because fish can be contaminated with mercury or PCBs or a clean supplement. And that's where the quality of your supplement really, really matters. But omega-3s are hands down one of the most important things you can do to support periconception and preconception health. Um, and here we see maternal dietary omega-3 deficiency worsens, worsens the deleterious effects of prenatal inflammation on the gut-brain axis across lifetime. So when I talk about don't be scared, do something. Take an omega-3 fatty acid supplement. Make sure you're taking a good clean one. Support your baby's preconception and lifelong health. Vitamin D, another huge impact. Um, you will go to your doctor. They will check your vitamin D. If it's 28, 29, 30, they'll tell you it's probably fine, slightly low. Truth is, for optimal health, we want it to be somewhere between 50 and 75. So it's important to know the reference range because if you, if you check it with your obstetrician or gynecologist, they may tell you a level of 30 is fine. I don't consider that fine. And most people in the functional medicine world do not. Um, we know that studies of vitamin D have a, there are strong associations between deficiencies or low vitamin D levels with preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, need for C-section, which then affects your baby's microbiome and will impact again, can impact long-term health, also related to intrauterine growth deficits and preterm birth. Um, we also see more and more evidence every year on the association of asthma, allergies, and impaired neurodevelopment with low levels of vitamin D. And your vitamin D level is impacted by overweight and obesity, low sun exposure, which happens to many of us in the winter, but many of us who live in northern latitudes don't even get enough sun exposure even in the summer, um, especially with increased use of sunscreen and a very indoor lifestyle. And those with darker skin have more trouble making vitamin D. So again, this is an easy fix if you know your vitamin D is low. Supplement your vitamin D. You can make profound changes that way, but don't supplement it excessively. You have to know, you know, know the appropriate doses. Now, choline is a very underappreciated nutrient, super important for neurologic health, for adults, for, every, for kids, but it is often very low in women. Um, we see it chronically deficient. It does, it is essential for fetal brain development. So imagine women are often low in it, chronically low, and yet it's essential for fetal brain development. Um, it actually can reduce some of that maternal inflammation that we see can have negative effects down the road. Um, deficiencies can impair the maturation of neurocircuits and also link to schizophrenia and other disorders in life. And one of the best ways you can get choline is from eggs. I am, so I see a lot of people who are still fearful of eggs, unless you have a specific reason why you can't consume eggs, they can be really, really important of a preconception and prenatal diet. But again, that may be individualized and one egg a day isn't enough. So you want a prenatal vitamin that also includes choline or you want to supplement it regularly. Um, and then also, what do we have too much of? Those inflammatory triggers, processed foods, sugars, certain types of fats that I talked about, those trans fats, those hydrogenated fats, those excess omega-6s from vegetable oils, like canola oil, um, and then possibly gluten, possibly dairy, or possibly other food sensitivities or allergies. It can be any of these things. It can be just... A, you know, all of this, um, but all of these combined increase maternal inflammation. Maternal inflammation can lead to increased risk of chronic illness. So again, autism, asthma, obesity, tics, gestational diabetes, childhood diabetes, as well as other you know, diseases have been linked to maternal inflammation during pregnancy. So these are the body burdens. This is the bucket that we have, and we're trying to empty that bucket by reducing those Thing, the, the things in our food, these things that we're talking about, um, these inflammatory foods. And then we also want to think about what's coming in in other ways. We're exposed to toxins always in our air, our water, our food, our personal care and household products. We also, in terms of lifestyle interventions, want to address stress and physical activity. So we want to look in our homes, we want to look at our cleaners, our lawn care, flame retardants, dry cleaning. All these things can increase our exposure to toxins. So one of the things that's important is looking for parabens. Parabens are, often, you know, are found in um, personal care products, shampoos, creams, conditioners, moisturizers, sunscreens, deodorants, all that stuff. We don't want parabens. Parabens are absorbed through our fat cells and they are transferred and they are linked to increased risk of chronic illness. Um, they can disrupt your hormones. We see women, they can actually affect your fertility. Um, 
but they also affect birth outcomes. And we see them in the urine. They've done studies of the urine of infants and they are filled with parents. So here's a great place to find, like I said, I can't say enough about the environmental working group and I don't make any money from supporting them. I, I give them money. Um, they have this great thing called Skin Deep. You can you know, put in your search engine, whatever product you're looking for. If you own something, you wanna see if it's more toxic or less toxic, or you can just search for sunscreen and it's gonna come up with the ones they think are safest. Awesome. We also wanna banish toxic bedding. So from, bedding often is filled with flame retardants, formaldehyde, um, volatile organic compounds, dyes, bleaches, other things. You're really not supposed to inhale or absorb those things. And the thing that they are linked to diabetes and neurodevelopmental delays, as well as cancer, reproductive health, thyroid changes. And one thing that's really important here is that very often exposure to liquid when they're wet, they start to off gas more. So think about you put a baby in a crib and the baby leaks because the baby's peeing all night long and it leaks through the diaper. You know, we don't often pee in our beds. We're not getting our beds wet. Babies are. So when you, so both preconceptually for you, but also for your infants, we don't want them exposed to these things and then wetting the bed. Um, there are these different um, labels are, you can find these on the labels of furniture and bedding and they indicate that they are um, safer and less toxic. In terms of kitchen storage, a lot of the things we see a lot is bisphenol A and phthalates. Anything plasticized, soft plastic, plastic wrap, water bottles, food wrap, those storage bags, Ziploc bags, these are all known endocrine disruptors. They impact reproduction, they impact fertility, they are linked to cancer, diabetes, and obesity. And remember, obesity leads to more chronic illness. They're ubiquitous. Again, we find them in newborn babies. So use glass storage containers, switch to steel or glass water bottles, wrap foods in wax paper, parchment paper, beeswax, um, and use silicone storage bags if you can. Those are some of the ways you can reduce that body burden. And then we also have our cleaning supplies. Chlorine-free, phosphate-free are best. Avoid fragrances, which are often filled with phthalates. Um, watch out, again, petroleum-based items, diantriethanolamines are carcinogens. And you don't, you know, you can buy really great products and you can check. There's another um, link I'm going to give you. There's lots of ways to find good, healthy cleaning products. But again, they can be expensive. Vinegar, lemon juice, baking soda, and water can do a great job in cleaning the house. And you can make that for, for virtually nothing. But again, the EPA has a safer choice website where you can add, look for safe cleaning products. Um, and it can be quite healthy. I mean, quite beneficial to use this as a resource, but the Environmental Working Group also has a resource. Um, so we were gonna talk about air filters. We talked about that a little bit before. What's in the air in your home? There's, you know, there's toxins outside the home, but our homes are actually more toxic. And when we don't open the windows, that often allows that to build up. We've got those flame retardant particles. We've got volatile organic compounds. We've got dust, pollen, and dander, which can increase allergies, inflammation, et cetera. Mold spores, mildew, bacteria, and viruses. Plants are one of the best ways to filter and clean your air, but they won't completely do the job. Good ventilation also matters. And then picking the right type of air filter. And there are different types. I'm not gonna go into the details, but HEPA is one of the best, but carbon, ionic, and UV also have their role. The other thing we wanna think about is stress. And you look at the March of Dimes, this is just a page I took from the March of Dimes. Internal stress is associated with poor birth outcomes, mm -hmm. including preterm birth, infant mortality, low birth weight, increases inflammation, and um, is linked to poor outcomes. So how do you reduce stress? Bottom line is, what I say is, whatever you like, meditation, yoga, heart math, nature, rituals, spirituality, physical activity, music, whatever works, and, re and whatever, however you can reduce the stress inducers. But once you are stressed, this is a way to address it. And then physical activity, super important, even if it's a walk. Reduces your back pain, eases constipation, um, decreases your risk of gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, and C-section. Helps promote healthy weight during pregnancy. Tones your uterus, strengthens your muscles, but it also ameliorates stress and improves sleep, both of which have a direct impact on that maternal inflammation. So I also want to talk a little bit about advocacy. How do you talk to your family about this? How do you communicate with your healthcare providers? What's going on? So in terms of advocacy, you wanna do your research. You want to ask a lot of questions and you wanna use a decision tree when you're coming to these questions about, you know, do I wanna supplement vitamin D? 
Do I want to change my healthcare products? Do I want to um, get a water filter? Think about what is the healthiest option for you and your baby? And then what is that best choice and what are your possible alternatives and what's the risk benefits to each choice you might make? And then you want to be able to use that, take that evidence. You know, so this could be choosing a healthcare product. It could also be having a conversation with a doctor about, no, I really want to do hemoglobin A1C prior to, you know, in my first, you know, prior to getting pregnant, because I want to know if I have good blood sugar regulation. He might say that's not necessary. You want to show the evidence that says, no, I, I researched this and I can show you these studies that show that blood sugar management strongly impacts, you know, healthy pregnancy. And the other thing I would say is at the end of the day, yes, keep it simple, sister. Identify what information you need to know and how to get it. So from all the things I just talked to you about, which are the things that are important for you or that you don't know about? Do you know your family history? Do you know your MTHFR status? Do you know your vitamin D level? Determine your support systems and resources. So if something's super, super hard to do, don't choose that first. Go with that low hanging fruit. What's the easiest thing to change? Is it changing your kitchen supplies? Is it changing your household cleaners? Is it taking an omega-3 supplement? Do that. Progress, not perfection, one day at a time. Don't overwhelm. Overwhelm and stress. We're trying to limit stress, but you can be empowered to take action. I don't discuss brands specifically. There are a few questions about that. I will say thoughts on seeking health prenatal. Uh, you should, you could do a little Googling about the seeking health one. It does hit all of my recommendations. It doesn't have as much of the dose as I like for some of them. And there was some concern about some identification of heavy metals. So just do your research on that one. But um, there are some other ones I tend to recommend more often. Um, for people with a double mutation of MTHFR, is it a misconception that they need to megadose? Yes, it is a misconception they need to megadose. Um, there is not a correlation one-to-one -one relationship between the single versus double mutation and how much you need. That has not been elucidated yet. And you can still give, we, we still don't know the effects, especially preconceived conception and fetally on those high doses. So I don't err on the side of getting really high with methylfolate, but I will only use methylfolate and I will give what I think is an appropriate dose. Um, somebody said, I believe more OBs need this information. Supplement, when I was pregnant with my first, I was on government supplemental health care. I have Hashimoto's, bacterial infection. You have antibiotics the entire pregnancy. Yeah, so yes. So though you, you, you nailed it. I mean, those are the things that we want to help people understand and address. Um, you say you're somebody's, oh yeah, your daughter is now type one diabetic with Hashimoto's, right? Um, I see you said something else mentioned removing gluten for thyroid, dairy necessary, depends. And again, that's individualized. I can't speak to that one person to another. Um, Gluten-free food for children with ASD, casein-free food, recommended or not. Oh, hello from Croatia. Um, what do I say about it? Well, that's a more of a discussion for that individual child, whether that diet is, I mean, I recommend GFCF diets for lots and lots of kids on the spectrum. I don't think there's many risks to it, as long as you concentrate on getting them adequate nutrition, but a gluten and dairy-free diet um, preconceptually is another issue and that's individual. Um, I understand that all these factors are more important in mothers, but I'm just curious, studies investigating dietary considerations of fathers. Thank you for asking that. That's why I said mom and dad's health history, absolutely. So um, yes, dad can have that impact. So we also want, it's not gonna be the same. The baby's not growing in dad. So his exposures are less powerful, but they are powerful, which is why all that home stuff, changing the BPA, the parabens, the phthalates, getting the toxins out of the water and the food is gonna affect dad as well. And his semen is gonna be safer and healthier. Um, so yes, dads matter. Um, and okay, so I'm gonna, that was the chats I had from the Q&A. Can you take too much CoQ10? Yeah, you shouldn't overdose CoQ10. Um, same with omega-3s, yes. And again, individualized, I'm not gonna give doses for that, but um, yes, you don't wanna overdose things. More is not always better. That's just not how it goes. So yes, individual support is helpful um, to know that. Okay, so now I'm in the chat area. And somebody asked the same question about, yeah, your same question about dads. Yes, thank you for that question. I appreciate that. Um, and, and again, if somebody's having fertility problems, there's a number of nutrients for dad, including carnitine, CoQ10, and zinc that can be helpful, um, but you want to have that explored. What do I say? Oh yeah, this is the same question. 
welcome. I'm time limited. If I'm time limited due to my age, isn't it better to leave my mercury fillings in place? Yes. Yes. So again, we didn't really talk about that. Um, people think, do you talk about getting rid of mercury fillings? Getting rid of mercury fillings will release mercury vapor into your body. You will absorb it. So if you are planning to get pregnant quite soon, I would not, um, I would not be removing those fillings at that time. And what brands do you prefer for prenatals? Do you recommend taking them even before conception? hundred percent. Absolutely. You should take your prenatals when you start trying to conceive, if not before. Um, at a minimum of six months, you should be on a prenatal um, because that's going to give you all those things you need for the first trimester. If you wait till you find out you're pregnant, you're already, you're already in it. And you've, missed a, you've missed a good opportunity. So um, I would definitely take your prenatals as soon as you are trying to conceive or even earlier. And certainly if you were on all contraceptives, as soon as you get off them. And I, I'm mixed on whether to even tell you guys this. Um, Aviva Ram has a really, I, I think she's a great resource for women, um, but her focus is not on risk reduction. I mean, it is in general, but it's more overall women, women's health. Um, she doesn't have the autism, chronic illness leaning, but she provides wonderful information. And she has a download of her favorite prenatals. Full Circle is one of them, but she also recommends a few that are not my favorite, but it is a good resource if you want to take a quick look at it. And I am actually planning to come out with my own as well. <laughs>